Welcome to the broadcast and our conversation about World War II and the veterans. It, it's a tough question and, and I, you know, that's, I've, I've been here 18 years now um, and just as a very broad generalization, I think Americans are very forward-looking people, which is a, in many ways a great thing. A dialogue on World War II and the vets next. Welcome to Talk About Our Times, I'm Litch. Dr. Pierre Faber is here. Originally from Johannesburg, South Africa, Dr. Faber and his wife, then Dr. Margaret McCutcheon, met as members of the track and field teams at Oxford University. Dr. Margaret graduated from New York University and received her master's and PhD degrees in cultural anthropology from Oxford. Dr. Pierre graduated from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, receiving a degree in veterinary surgery, his master's and PhD degrees in management studies from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. The couple owned Classic Africa, a touring safari company in Middle Haddam, Connecticut. Classic Africa is a supreme provider of travel services to Southern and East Africa. The company was formed in 1999. In 2004, Dr. Pierre, with much pride, became a United States citizen. For a few years now, Margaret and Pierre Faber host an invitation-only VJ Day party at their lovely, exquisite home where Margaret's parents, Lois and Ronald McCutcheon, assist. This veterans celebration provides music, cocktails, a sumptuous dinner, and it's all a tribute, a formal salute to the World War II veterans who served our country unconditionally. It's a memorable event for those vets who attend each and every year. The Fabers are most gracious and honor these women and men with the highest order of grace and a picture-perfect event. And I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Pierre Faber. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lich. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. You always pay such homage to the vets. It's about time that somebody and I know how humble you are, but allowed you to voice your inner feelings in your mind and in your heart about what goes on with those vets in the past and for what you do today. Well, Let's start by talking about your grandfather. Your grandfather served as a non-combatant in World War II. So my question to you is, how do you feel about those who served so valiantly in the war? So, yeah. It's, it's true, I think, and, and I think that he almost regretted, well, he, he, was, he was in a sense perhaps disappointed that he, he never got to actually serve in combat. Um, and, and there was always a great sense of respect and honor for people who did. And it goes, I think my background, my interest in World War II, my reverence for the veterans perhaps goes beyond just my grandfather. But you know, that the, the society I grew up in, the school that I went to, um, veterans, particularly World War II veterans, were, were very highly honored. And um, my school every year would do a Remembrance Day event. Um, and you know, a lot of it was, was oriented towards First World War and Second World War veterans. But yeah, it, it is, it instilled in me, I think, an appreciation and understanding of the significance of World War II in world history. And, um, and, a, and a very deep respect for people who were involved. It was a, it was a horrific war, obviously the greatest war that, that the world's ever seen, the worst war that the world's ever seen. And, and people were fighting, I think, along you know, pretty black and white lines of good and bad. And, and the, you know, the people who gave so much and people who um, sacrificed so much for the cause of good, is, it's something to, to remember and something to, to honor. The solid foundation going back to your childhood. Speak to what it was that really kind of made the dream a reality for you to start studying the history and, and all the biographies and autobiographies about the war. Um, well, I, 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 it's just I, I have a, an amateur interest in, in history and. Um, World War II. I think what, what makes World War II an interesting subject for me is because 
it is still recent enough that there are, there are people around who were there. And, and that's one of the reasons, I think, that's one of the things that, that led us to, to do the party for World War II veterans, is because it's not, ju you, you don't just have to study it from books. They're actually living people who, who participate in some of these, you know, most significant events in, in world history. And so you can actually get a hands-on personal connection to, 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 to the event. And so that's, you know, I, I, I guess I have a, an amateur interest in history quite broadly, but, but what's really special about World War II is you've got these living people who, who were there. Now I know there's probably a reservoir of just uh, surreal stories that you've heard from all of these vets. <clears throat> Any one in particular that's illuminated in your mind's eyes? I think the, the ones that stand out to me um, are the, the ones that are perhaps more trivial in nature um, and, and, and not, not necessarily about the, you know, the combat itself and, and you know, all the intensity of that. And, um, so, I mean, so, so some sort of you know, frivolous li li little observations. Um, there's one veteran who was involved in, in the capture of the bridge at Remagen, which was very significant. That was the first crossing point that the Allies got across the Rhine. He, he, he doesn't tell me stories about the battle, but he loves to tell a story about how he saw a jet airplane coming over the, the bridge shortly after they captured it. And just his impressions and his emotions at seeing, you know, first of all, hearing the, 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 the incredibly loud sound of the jet engine, and then seeing a plane flying so fast that it, it, was, you know, it was almost like a UFO to him. It was something completely foreign and something that he'd never even conceived of. Um, and, and that's what he remembers about the battle for the bridge with Remagen. So it, it's, you know, I think it's those little, almost personal stories like that. Um, Fill in this line for me. My deepest respect, my utmost respect, and my admiration for these veterans comes from? Um, I would... I would, yeah, I, I would say perhaps certainly to a certain extent it's an appreciation for history, for understanding the importance of history and things that happened in the past. And there's a certain sense of humility about that as well. You know, it's no, I think, to take a step back and not think that we have all the answers um, and that we're discovering everything for the first time. You know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the issues that we face, a lot, a lot of the challenges we have, have been dealt with before by people in the past. Um, so an appreciation of history definitely is part of it. Um, but yeah, there, there's probably something in my background between, as I said, the school that I went to, my grandfather, um, there's probably personal aspects that, that kind of bring it to life for me as well. Now we're gonna speak about your specific August event a little later on. But first I wanna ask you, what do you think we, here in the United States need to do that maybe we're not doing or we need to do, but we need to amp it up more. What do you think we need to do to really continue to honor and pay the utmost of respect to, to these blessed people? It, it's a tough question. And, and I, you know, that's, I've, I've been here 18 years now. Um, and just as a very broad generalization, I think Americans are very forward-looking people, which is a, in many ways a great thing. But I think people do sometimes not pay as much attention to, to history, as certainly as they do in, in other parts of the world. Um, the one thing that, that I would say is if you have a, a relative who is in World War II, whether they're still alive or not, just appreciate how kind of historically important, how, how significant they are. You know, if, if you're blessed and if they're still alive, take every opportunity you, you have to spend time with them. Um, you know, that, that's, I, I once read or, or heard some, somebody um, who suggested if, if you had the opportunity to spend time with a Civil War veteran or a Revolutionary War veteran, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you just jump at that opportunity? And, well, you know, and certainly from a global perspective, World War II veterans are at least as kind of historically significant, or perhaps even more so, than Civil War or Revolutionary War veterans. So take advantage of whatever connections you have. If, they, if they're alive, spend time with them. If they passed, you know, honor, honor and remember them. Let's stay with this then. Referred to as the great generation because? They're, because they, they, they won the worst, world, worst war that the world's ever seen. Um, 
They, they incurred enormous sacrifices. And it is, it's a, you know, I think the phrase the greatest generation is, I've heard people sort of question that. And, and it's true, you know, the Revolutionary War generation, the Civil War, these were great generations as well. So perhaps it's more accurate to, to call them the last great generation. They were the last <laughs> generation of Americans that you know, really achieved you know, something truly world-changing. Um, but yes, they, they, they did. And, and it's not just the people who went off to war. The, 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 the um, deprivations and the sacrifices that the people who stayed at home had to make are also very impressive. You know, there was rationing. Um, and it was a, it was, life was hard for everybody. The whole country was, was involved in one way or another. In, in, in finally, you know, the, the ultimate victory, and everybody sacrificed. Sometimes war will divide people. In this particular war, it brought people together, yeah. both here and abroad. Yeah, and, and I do think that it, it is, it's probably the last war that we've had that where it, there was such a clear demarcation between good and bad, and, and you know, everybody was pretty much on board. Yeah, agreed. Um, with, with the cause. I know you're humble, but your celebration. Blessed day for these veterans, which I know stays with them well beyond the last Saturday in August each year. It stays with them. The homage that, that you, Margaret, her parents, all those who assist, it was spawned, it was created, it came out of and it arose from what bottom line? So getting to meet some of these veterans, it, it, it was one of the things that struck me when I came here is I guess because so many Americans were involved in the war, um, because there was conscription and so, so many of them fought, there were a lot of veterans around and I had an opportunity to meet them and spend time with them. And first of all, I, I just I got along really well with them. I, I, I enjoyed listening to the stories and, and it occurred to me that it would be even more fun to get a bunch of them together. You know, so I'd see them one, one here, one there, and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to, to, to get, a, get these guys all together? Um, and you know, it's, it, it is, it, as you say, it's, it's honoring them, um, but it's also an incredible honor and privilege for us to, you know, as I said, to spend time with people who are, who are involved in such, such an important historical event. And it's also an opportunity to, um, to, to, to show really positive role models for, 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 for my two young boys. I have two young sons. And, you know, if there's anybody that I'd like to hold up and, and honor in front of them, you know, you, you, you'd be hard pressed to pick people you know, better, better than the, the World War II veterans. Most people wouldn't do this. The Fabers do this. And they do it in such a grand, glorious way. And these men and these women they walk away with their hearts overflowing. It's an overwhelming day that you and your family provide these veterans with, and it's, it really is a loving afternoon and oh, evening. Thank you, it, it, it works out well. And you know, a lot of the credit goes to the volunteers. We, we have a, a, a large group of people who come and help us. Um, it's, it's a pretty big event. We, we normally have over 100 guests, including the veterans and their family members that they bring. And there's no way that we could do it without significant help from a lot of people who want. And I think it speaks to th there is a deep-seated respect. People people remember the World War II veterans, and 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 they want to give of their time and their energy to 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 uh, honor them as well. Um, so yeah, it does. It works out. And you know, we've been lucky the last few years. We've had great weather as well. We we do pick. You know, we we use VJ Day almost as an excuse to get it at the end of August because, in my experience, that tends to be a time of year when you can sort of you more or less reliably get, get good weather, and that helps a lot. I, I will say, the very first year we did it, 2011, it happened to fall on the date of Hurricane Irene, um, but we were small enough then, I think we had about 10 or 12 veterans, we could bring it all inside, and so we had dinner inside while the hurricane was raging outside, and again, you know, hats <laughs> off to them for coming to the event, even though there was a hurricane going on. <laughs> then again, you really, <laughs> literally opened your doors yeah, to exactly, everybody. Exactly. Then President Clinton stated this on June 6, 1994, the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And correct me if I'm wrong, I believe President Clinton was the first American president born after World War II. Quote, we are the children of your sacrifice. We are the sons and daughters you saved from tyranny's reach. 
We grew up behind the shield of the strong alliances that you forged in blood upon these beaches, on the shores of the Pacific, and in the skies above. We flourished in the nation that you came home to build. The most difficult days of your lives brought us 50 years of freedom, end quote. And Pierre Faber would expound on those supreme words with... So, yeah, and, and um, I do think so, and I'd go perhaps even a step beyond that <clears throat> and say that World War II essentially set America on a trajectory to become the greatest superpower that the world's ever seen. Um, you know, prior to World War II, the, 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 the center of power still pretty much lay in Europe. Um, but after World War II, that, that shifted very much to, towards the USA. And, and we are, to a large extent, living on not just the freedom, but the prosperity that, that, the, that the victory in, in World War II, that, you know, that, that the World War II generation bought for us through their hard work, sacrifice, and, and blood, as, as he says. So, yes, it, it's, it's worth taking a step back and realizing that, that a lot of what we have is in large measure thanks to what they did. If Dr. Pierre were to serve in World War II, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, you'd select which one and what would be the appeal? <laughs> I would try and avoid any of them, <laughs> but I would, you know, and, and it's, it's a good question. My, my grandfather didn't get to go and serve overseas in combat because he was an asthmatic, and I, I'm also an asthmatic. So Army probably wouldn't work for me. I think I'd probably have to default to the Navy because of the, the, the lesser physical requirements, but, and I, I may even be wrong on that. Maybe may that the Navy's even, even tougher than the Army, but that's probably the, the only one that I could, I could see myself in. I'm too big to fit in airplane cockpits from that time frame. <laughs> so that kind of rules that one out for me. So if they take me anywhere, I'd hope that maybe it would be the Navy. <laughs> and the appeal for that would be? Um, well, the, essentially by default, because I think, um, you know, that, that's, that's probably the only branch, as I said, kind of jokingly, probably the only, only one where I, I might, might, might have a chance. Um, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't see myself as a, as, as a warrior, really. That's, I don't <laughs> think, I, I, I honor them, and that's maybe one of the reasons that I honor and respect them so much, because I know that it's something that I would not really be able to do. I don't want you to necessarily focus or channel in on somebody from the United States. If so, if it is, so be it. But which of the generals do you have probably the most respect for in World War II? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, and, you know, I don't, perhaps to play devil's advocate, um, I, you know, perhaps, perhaps Rommel, perhaps Erwin Rommel of the German army, because he was, he was one officer, one high-ranking German officer who stood out for his refusal to accept Hitler's orders to, to, to you know, uh, round up Jews or, 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 or you know, um, in, be involved in the extermination. He was involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler. He was, he kind of stands out as somebody who stood by his principles and, and he tried, and I'm sure that he had failings, but he tried to do right in, in the face of some very, very unpleasant um, prospects for, for, for um, retribution. So, that, yeah, I, I think perhaps for, for, for standing up as best he could to evil, I, I might go with Rommel. It is quite interesting to me that you pick Rommel because as we were talking before the broadcast, before we sat down, you know, I, I had told you that I was with uh, retired Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Alex this morning, and I asked him that same question. He said Rommel. Yeah. Tactical. That's, yeah. Very, 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 and he was the one who had tremendous respect for Patton. Yes, yes, well, I, I think all, all the German officers, and that's one of the reasons I think D-Day was so successful was because the, the Allies used Patton as a decoy, and they, they set up a whole fake army group that was going to attack across at Calais, and the Germans went along with that because they, they couldn't conceive that America would not use Patton to, to attack the mainland. And so they sort of positioned their most impressive forces against where they thought Patton was going to be landing, leaving Normandy pretty much largely un, you know, defended by, by their, their, their less good troops. Many people think that sometimes Patton colored outside the line, stepped, out, stepped over his boundary lines. Some respect it, some don't. Dr. Pierre thinks. Yeah, I, I, 
I personally, not having known him and just from my kind of superficial research, I think Patton was a great general. I think he was the, by f the, the, the Allies' best general. Um, he did some controversial things, um, but as, for his military ability, his, his military brain and his drive, his energy, in, in, a, in a military context, he was absolutely brilliant. I think politically, he was not as, you know, that's where his downfall came was he didn't have the political savvy to go with it. Um, but militarily, he was brilliant. I, I heard an interview about uh, two weeks or so ago with the late Stephen Ambrose, and they were talking, and since you had brought up the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, they said, pick one general who you think was the most outstanding, exceptional general, not necessarily a good president, but who would you say deserves the highest accolades, highest kudos? And do you know he said Ulysses S. Grant? Out of everybody. Wow. Wow, that, yeah, that is interesting. I mean, it, it, each war had different demands and different requirements from, from generals. Um, but I mean, the Civil War was really tough because you're fighting your own people. You know, that, yeah. that's got to be an especially difficult task as a general to wage war on your own people. So, yeah, that I could see. I mean, I could see. And that. in that interview I heard with Stephen Ambrose, he even said that his autobiography was quite, quite uh, interesting to read. Again, not necessarily a great president, but, but in terms of a statistician, in terms of tactical abilities in, in the military, he, he picked Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. I want to go back to the fact that you had mentioned you would have served in the Navy. Let's, let's kind of put that to the side as a sidebar and say if you had to serve, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the United States. If it is, so be it. Mm -hmm. But if you had to serve in World War II, which of the generals or field marshals would you have wanted to serve under? Hmm. That's it. Of, so, speaking to the, the, the veterans, everybody who had anything to do with Patton absolutely adored him. He, he was clearly a very charismatic leader, and, and, um, and, and people, people loved being part of his, his, his army. Um, I, MacArthur, again, is kind of a controversial figure, um, but given that I'm sort of heading in the direction of the Pacific Theater, I, I think that, I, and you know, again, his drive, his, his determination to recapture the Philippines, I, I think that that's a leader I probably could have followed. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and on the German side? Phew. On the German side, again, you know, the, 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 only, the only German general for, for whom really one can have any kind of sympathetic feelings was, is probably Rommel because of, you know, the way he... Von Manstein was brilliant. I think he was sort of in, in, in the early days in the Eastern oh, Front, yeah. um, an absolutely brilliant m military general. But again, you know, you, you've, you've got all the baggage of, of, of the Holocaust that goes with there, so... Your roots in South Africa. Tell me your thoughts, both as a, as a, as a gentleman, and as a military man of Field Marshal Smuts? Jan Smuts is, we, after Nelson Mandela, Jan Smuts is the most significant figure in, in South African history. Um, he, he, he was, he was an, an incredibly intelligent man, ve very learned man, and, and he also, he was a great leader. Um, you know, his, his, his military exploits were, I think, average, um, but, but he, was, he, was, he was a really great leader. And, he came from an Afrikaans background. That's a, you know, a lot of you need to understand a little bit about this, uh, the, the history of South Africa and, and the cultural divides. But in pre-Second World War South Africa, um, the, the white population was split between English-speaking and Afrikaans-speaking, um, the descendants of Boers and the, and the descendants of, of the, the British settlers. And Smuts came from an Afrikaans background, but he led the country as part of the British Empire. And, and he made really tough decisions as a leader, and he, he took South Africa into the Second World War on the British side, which a lot of his fellow Afrikaners were, were not terribly happy about. So he, he was, you know, he, he was a bold leader who, who made hard decisions for the, the good of, of the country. Um, you know, and, and they ended up losing, his party ended up losing the election after the Second World War. He, they paid a, a, a price for it but they did what was right. And again, that's something you take your hat off to somebody who makes a tough decision to do what's right and then suffers the consequences. In South Africa, World War II, you have that division line for people who said, let's stay neutral, let's, let's get into it, let's not get into it at all. Yes. What was, what was the, the, 
overwhelming choice between most of the population at that point in time. So, and again, you know, this is, this is I'm going, going on secondhand knowledge here, but it, there was, a, the Afrikaans speaking people um, have heritage from Germanic roots, and also during the, during the Boer War, the Anglo-Boer War, which is pretty much South Africa's civil war, Germany had been very supportive of, of the Boers, of, of the, 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 what were to become the Afrikaners. So they had historical ties and, and, and they, they, they felt an affinity towards Germany. And you know, at the very least, they didn't want to go to war with them. I think they were probably a, a, a fairly significant minority that would have been interested in going to war for, for Germany. Um, but you know, the English speakers were obviously saw themselves as part of the British Empire and they were very much for South Africa's involvement on, on the side of, of the Allies. So there, there was, it, it, was a, it was a tough split um, and Smuts went, went against his own background um, and did what he thought was right for the country, not just for his segment of the country. When Germany goes into North Africa, smart move as he was deciding to take over all of Europe and was that a smart move uh, from your focal point? Smart yeah. move for Hitler to take to start moving into North Africa or not? So I think that the, the, the goal there was um, to, to, to get to, 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 to oil. You know, Ger Germany was, was very, a very resource poor, poor country and oil was, was, was one of the main drivers behind sort of strategic decisions. And, and so from that perspective, yes, potentially. It was also, they were pulled into it by, by their allies, the Italians, um, who were trying to sort of es establish a, an empire in, in Africa and um, and so by virtue of the treaty that Germany had with Italy they they were kind of almost compelled to, to go and assist them so I think on balance no I think it was a mistake um, and it was a distraction and it diverted you know already Germany was fighting a war on two fronts and then another diversion I think they spread themselves very thin in the end. Lastly Pierre with the 90 seconds we have remaining when do you stop learning? Never. You're you're always evolving, you're always maturating, you're always learning. As you learn the history of World War II, still magical for you? Yes, yeah, 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 yes, I mean, the, the, and there's still a lot of scholarly work coming out about it. There's, there's new documents being found. That's, remember that a lot of the um, documentation, a lot of the history of World War II was top secret and, and it's only kind of slowly but surely being, being released into the public domain. Um, there's, there's a lot of a lot of new information, a lot of new ideas, a lot of new theories coming out about World War II, and it certainly it remains until we have well, let's hope we never have it, but until we have World War III, that it's still it's going to be a, the, the 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 worst war, war that the world's ever fought. November Veterans Day, also Thanksgiving, so your August event, and paying homage again to the veterans, it kind of brings it all together. Classic Africa, your company, Dr. Pierre, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. Literally, Greatly it's just a pleasure. It. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for Talk About Our Times. I'm Lich. See you again next time. Until then, keep me in your thoughts.